Hello, I'm Anthony Slide, and I am privileged to welcome you to this relatively rare and seldom seen Ernst Lubitsch production of Free Women. No question as to who is the star of the film. The title card announces the film is an Ernst Lubitsch production, while the first credit card acknowledges Lubitsch as director. His name appears on the next card, listing those involved in the screenplay. Then we get the technical credits. And then finally, the players, none of whom are featured and all of whom are listed together on the final credit card. With May McAvoy surprisingly, in my opinion, getting top billing over Pauline Frederick. The film opens with Pauline Frederick looking not too happy as she weighs herself. I know the feeling. I go to a doctor who still uses scales identical to these. There are some things that never change in life, and the depression at discovering your weight is one of them. It has been pointed out that just as Lubitsch began his previous film, The Marriage Circle, also released in 1924, with an unusual and unexpected scene depicting a man discovering a hole in his sock, so, here, does he begin the film with a shot of the bars on a scale. Each shot says something about the female in the story. Here it is the vanity of the principal character. Pauline Frederick, what a beautiful woman, so poised, so elegant, a woman of a certain age who was never ashamed or embarrassed to play this type of role. A woman desperately clinging to youth, despite, as is revealed a little later, she is the mother of an 18-year-old daughter. Pauline Frederick was 40 years old when this film was made, way past her prime in terms of conventional Hollywood stardom. I think she is one of the great dramatic actresses of the screen, and yet she was in all probability more important as a stage performer, and certainly she herself considered her work in the theatre more important than her work in films. But thankfully, we have films such as this to show us what we missed by not having been present as she enthralled theatre audiences. A charity ball in the ballroom of New York's Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Or perhaps more precisely, Hollywood's idea of what a New York charity ball might be like. The slide down from the balcony to the ballroom floor seems a little bit over the top, but as we shall see, it does serve a purpose in bringing the two principal characters together. Luke Cody, as Mr. Lamont, is happily throwing his money around until he notices a group of his creditors checking out his behaviour and hastily stops. Principal among the creditors is the portly Willard Lewis as Harvey Craig. He was to die two years later in July 1926 in Glendale, California, after a screen career that lasted from the early 1910s until his death. His most important roles were as the Prince of Wales in another Warner Bros. film from 1924, Beau Brummel, starring John Barrymore, and in the 1922 Douglas Fairbanks production of Robin Hood, in which he played Friar Tuck. It's interesting that his wife, Maud, had a fairly prominent role in what is probably Pauline Frederick's greatest film success, Madame X, in 1920. Poor Willard Lewis was only 44 when he died, while Maud lived on in Glendale until she was 92. The Willard Lewis character is not just here for comic relief, if you can call it that, but actually plays a significant role in the storyline. There are a lot of extras, Warner Bros. claimed 500, finding employment for several days of shooting. Although I suspect there are not quite as many as one would be led to believe, I noticed quite a few showing up in almost every shot. Although truth be told, they are doing what extras quickly learn to do, and that is position themselves close to the leading players, and then, when a different camera angle is called for, they will have to be placed again in the same position. According to contemporary newspaper reports, as of June 12, 1924, this sequence had already been filming for a few days, with filming completed on the night of Saturday, June the 14th. The extras are identified as dress extras, which signifies that they owned evening attire, and so the studio did not have to spend money on their costumes. The savings to the studios was, of course, great, but it did mean that not only did the extras have to make certain their costumes were in good shape, but also that they were up to date. It all cost money, which extras didn't have. And so, for example, 
male ex dress extras would often wear tuxedos that had turned from black to green with age, while some ladies had evening gowns that belonged to a different era. Sorry, I can't identify the elderly creditors. The slide has served its purpose, bringing the Lou Cody and Pauline Frederick characters into contact for the first time. I suppose the Pauline Frederick character has a go on the slide simply to prove that despite her age, she can still behave in a youthful fashion. I have never understood the appeal of Lou Cody. I'm not denying that he's a good actor, but somehow he seems unappealing, almost seedy really. I suppose it may be that small moustache. There is something about men with small moustaches that is off-putting. Adolf Hitler, for example. But then Adolf Manju has a small moustache and he seems most debonair and delightful. No, I'm sorry. But to me, Luke Cody seems something of a lounge lizard. But then you might respond, he is ideally cast in his role here. In the 1910s on screen, he was identified as a male vamp. And in real life, he was a womanizer hosting wild parties at his Beverly Hills home, which featured a door open upon which all the visiting celebrities had scratched their names and appropriate graffiti. Lou Cody checks out Mrs. Wilton's jewels and their value on her headdress, around her neck, on her wrist, on her dress, and on her feet. Little wonder that the Willard Lewis character and his cronies figure they have a chance to get back their money. As Mordaunt Hall wrote in the New York Times, the Lou Cody character is mentally weighing the earthly possessions of the women here before deciding which one to ask to dance. And it is the Pauline Frederick character. By the way, this set was claimed to be the biggest in the history of Warner Brothers at that time and built on the studio's newest stage. It is slightly odd here that as Mrs. Wilton, the $3 million widow, and Lamont leave the hotel, he gives what appears to be a chit for his car to the doorman. The latter returns, shaking his head and shrugging his shoulders, as if to say there is no car. But Lamont must have known this, so why pretend? The episode only allows for Harvey Craig to invite the couple to share his taxi, except his so-called cab looks more like a small chauffeur-driven limo. But the sequence serves a purpose in keeping the three characters together. It also shows that Lubitsch tries to limit the number of subtitles, or intertitles if you prefer. Critics at the time noticed that Lubitsch would rely on his actors and their facial expressions to get across the story rather than subtitles, or intertitles if you prefer. By the way, I must mention that Pauline Frederick's contract required that she provide her own costumes for the film. The actress must have had a very interesting wardrobe, that's all I can say. Three Women is very much not a typical Lubitsch film. There are some light comic moments, to be sure, but it is basically a serious drama concerning a middle-aged woman who becomes infatuated with an unscrupulous but not particularly young man who in turn seduces her daughter, as we will see later. The film starts light and then gets progressively heavy. In a way, the Pauline Frederick character will pay the price for her, her unreasoning attraction to Lou Cody. She will lose both the man and her daughter. As was explained by the Los Angeles Times back in 1924, writing about free women, every woman is at heart either a prostitute or a mother. That's an observation that is not going to go over too well today. The film is based on the 1914 novel Lily's Marriage by a German best-selling writer, Selma Reichel, who wrote under the pseudonym of Johann T. Mares. She was responsible for some 18 novels between 1914 and 1934, all with moral themes. The novels were highly erotic and advocated moral renewal, her career came to an end in 1938 when her books were placed on the list of harmful and undesirable literature by the Nazi regime. She almost survived the war but starved herself to death on April 12, 1945 
when the impending defeat of Germany marked the end of the country she loved. A wonderful little but telling touch as the Luke Cody character picks up a figurine on the piano and checks out the maker's mark, evaluating its value. It was apparently Lubitsch who made a decision to film the novel. He wasn't forced into it by the studio Warner Brothers. The scenario, in the words of a contemporary reporter, was carefully prepared by Lubitsch and Hans Crawley. That carefully prepared script assured a production that went speedily ahead. Shooting began in May 1924, and principal photography was completed on Friday, June 13th. The next day, Lubitsch and his wife drove up to Santa Barbara to relax at the Samarkand Persian Hotel, which still exists today as a senior citizen's home. The director returned to Los Angeles a few days later to begin editing the film. It was not until June 21st that Exhibitors Trade Review announced that Free Women was definitely decided upon as the title for the film. Lubitsch's collaborator on the script for Free Women was Hans Crawley, who was paid a total of $7,500 for his work. Hans Crawley was born in Hamburg, Germany in 1884. He and Lubitsch had first met when both were actors, appearing in the 1914 German film The Perfect 36. The following year, Hans Crawley wrote his first script for a film directed by Lubitsch, A Trip on the Ice, and a partnership began which thrived while the two were in Germany and continued as both emigrated to the United States. Among the most prominent of Lubitsch Crawley German collaborations are The Oyster Princess, 1919, Passion, 1919 with Pola Negri, Summerun, 1920, again with Pola Negri, and The Loves of Pharaoh, 1922 with Emil Jannings. Three Women was the first formal American collaboration of the pair, although Crowley did work uncredited on Lubitsch's previous film, The Marriage Circle. And apparently a portion of his salary for Three Women was to cover his involvement in the other production. Lubitsch and Hans Crowley worked together on all but two of the silent films that the former made after Three Women, some six in total, including The Patriot, 1928, for which Hans Crowley won the Academy Award for Best Writing. The John Barrymore vehicle Eternal Love in 1929 was the last film on which Lubitsch and Crowley worked together. Crowley was, quote, liquidated by Lubitsch, unquote, in the words of director Joseph von Sternberg. Lubitsch and Crowley had a fistfight after the former discovered that Crowley had had an affair with his wife Lainey. Crowley continued working through the early 1940s, primarily providing original stories for films, including the Deanna Durbin vehicles, 100 Men and a Girl, and It Started with Eve. In all probability, he had a problem with writing American dialogue, just a guess on my part. Perhaps more to the point, Lubitsch is believed to have systematically worked to ruin the future career of his former colleague. At one point, a German source claims, Hans Crowley was working as a wage clerk for one of the smaller studios. I don't really know if this can be, because he did have work in the industry as a screenwriter, and in fact in 1940 he had a play, Quiet Please, produced in New York at the Guild Theatre. Hans Crowley died after a lengthy illness in Los Angeles at the relatively young age of 60 in November 1950. Again, in a, according to a German source, he is buried in the Bergstrasse Cemetery in Berlin. As we have just seen, the letter that Mrs. Wilton has been trying to hide is far worse for her than a love letter. Rather, it is the letter from her daughter, a reminder of her age and that she doesn't want the girl coming to visit and interfering in her relationship with Lamont. Did you notice earlier the emphasis on Willard Lewis's eyes? There's not much he can do with his body because of his size, but he knows how to act with his expressive eyes. Mrs. Wilton is living in very much a Hollywood notion of a Park Avenue mansion, and Pauline Frederick reads a letter from her daughter, a letter which gently reminds her mother to send her a birthday gift, and again, we have expressive eyes, this time of Pauline Frederick. And as I mentioned, a close-up of the letter provides an explanation for that look. Her daughter is about to become 18. Well, 
While I have been talking, the action moves to Berkeley, California, and we meet Mae McAvoy playing the daughter Jeannie Wilton. Now I know the IMDb claims that among the college boys here are Charles Fowle and George J. Lewis. Perhaps they are. But while I think I can identify George Lewis here, I cannot recognise Charles Fowle. May McAvoy as Jeannie is actually 24 years old at this time. That's her real name. She had been on screen since 1917 and become a star four years later with her performance opposite Gareth Hughes in Sentimental Tommy. She is quite touchingly gentle and loving in the 1924 production of The Enchanted Cottage opposite Richard Barthamus. For her performance in Free Women, she was paid $1,750 a week. Playing the pawnbroker is an actor who is instantly recognisable to film buffs, Max Davidson. German-born in Berlin in 1875, this diminutive performer always seemed to play stereotypical Jewish roles, pawnbrokers and the like. Max Davidson usually appeared as comic characters in silent films produced by Hal Roach, but he has a straight role here and one which he handles with sensitivity and conviction. Ernst Lubitsch was to use Max Davidson again in 1942 when he had the actor standing in silence watching the Nazis march into Poland in his comic masterpiece, To Be or Not To Be. Another serious role. Sadly, Max Davidson died in semi-poverty at the Motion Picture Country House in September 1950 at the age of 75. Playing boyfriend Fred Coleman is a very obscure leading man from the 1920s, Pierre Gendron, who appeared in a few feature films from 1920 through 1927. None of the titles are well known. He actually, actually wrote a couple of plays that were produced on Broadway in the 1920s. And in the 1940s, Gendron wrote the original scripts for four B pictures in Hollywood. He was born Léon Pierre Gendron in Toledo, Ohio in 1896, and as Léon Gendron, he was brought to the screen as Madge Kennedy's leading man in the 1921 production of The Girl with the Jazz Heart. I really can't help feeling that he should have changed his second name, not his first, although Gendron is actually quite a common French name. In 1928, he married screenwriter Mary Alice Scully, and the couple had two children. He's not a great actor, as evidence of which Warner Brothers only paid him $200 a week, and he had to provide his own wardrobe. But he's good for this type of role, self-effacing and somewhat lacking in self-esteem. He's good-looking in a boy-next-door fashion, but he's hardly charismatic, the type of male that women might marry but not lust after. Pierre Gendron died in Hollywood in November 1956 at the age of 60. His wife died some 22 years later. A nice, typically Lubitsch moment as a couple try to escape from the other dancers into, gar into the garden. The sort of simple, yet sophisticated visual gag that came to be known as a Lubitsch touch. And there is another nice Lubitsch touch coming up as Fred rushes in speeded up motion to and from the house. And here it is as promised in a nicely edited sequence. But poor Fred's demented rush to and from the rather attractive house where Jeannie lives has been all in vain, as he discovers the gift that Mrs. Wilton has sent her daughter. He seems so inferior in contrast. And he is about to be, to be reminded by Jeannie that he gave up his watch for her gift. A scene between the two would-be lovers told with the minimum of subtitles or intertitles if you prefer. Whatever they are called, Lubitsch uses them sparingly. We need these quiet moments between the two juvenile leads. They help to give the audience a break from the frenetic activity of their fellow and sister students. 
And watching this charming scene, I am reminded that Free Women is Lubitsch's first American film with a modern setting, and his first American film actually set in the United States. It would not be until Heaven Can Wait in 1943 that he would again make a film with a modern American setting. Lubitsch used Mae McAvoy the following year to star as Lady Windermere in Lady Windermere's Fan, a role that she did not initially want to play. She claims that the director always called her McAvoy, but this doesn't seem very likely in that V is not pronounced W in German, it is pronounced F, so she will be Mae McAvoy. I should of course point out that all the interior scenes were shot at the Warner Brothers Studios in Hollywood at 5842 Sunset Boulevard. They were not filmed at the Burbank Studios, where Warner Brothers is located today. Is there no end to the enthusiasm of these college students? And May McAvoy seems very obtuse in not understanding Fred's infatuation or love for her. He is obviously more mature and looks it, while she is just young and fancy-free, as the saying goes. There's an interesting association between the film and Mae McAvoy. Her family owned a livery stable where the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, the site of the charity ball in Free Women, is located. And as the actor stood there alone on the platform, if one looked very closely, it is possible to make out the name San Bernardino on the building behind. In case you had forgotten, the daughter is attending UC Berkeley, and the obvious station from which to leave for the free day or so journey to New York would be San Francisco, so why San Bernardino? Well, obviously, it is only an hour from Los Angeles and an easy location for a film crew to use, but why did no one notice this glaring error in continuity? And now we are back in New York, and foolishly Mrs. Wilton has been persuaded to allow Lamont to invest $100,000 of her money. And while Mrs. Wilton gives her two maids the afternoon off and worries about the lighting and the effect on her facial features, let us talk about Pauline Frederick. The fan magazine Photoplay wrote of her performance here, I quote, It is limbed with a fine understanding of life and coloured with gripping fire and force. Miss Frederick's work in this film is worth going miles to see, unquote. I would agree. But I would also mention that it may well be regarded as a dress rehearsal for what is to be her greatest screen performance of the 1920s, that of Jane Vale, a highly successful businesswoman who falls in love with one of her much younger factory workers in Smouldering Fires, released in 1925. The director of that film is Clarence Brown, and there were many who hailed him at the time as a director comparable to Lubitsch, for whom Brown expressed great admiration. The actress appeared in almost 70 films between 1915 and 1937, but she never considered herself a movie star. She loved the stage, and as the saying goes, she always returned to the house with the free walls. Born in Boston in August 1885, the actress adopted the name of Pauline Frederick and made her New York debut in 1902. Her father didn't approve of her chosen profession and disinherited her. It didn't seem to bother her. She rose quickly to stardom and became a model for illustrator Harrison Fisher, who described her as, quote, the purest American beauty, unquote. The most famous of Pauline Frederick's stage roles, to which she is inextricably linked, despite not having starred in the original production, was Madame X, in which she toured America in 1926, played on the London stage also in 1926, and toured Australia. She starred in a screen version in 1920, directed by Frank Lloyd. The melodrama is of course similar to Free Women, and that it reaches its highest point with a murder trial. Pauline Frederick was married several times, and it is a wonderful example of life imitating art that in the mid-1920s she began a two-year relationship with a young actor named Clark Gable. They met when she was performing in Madame X in San Francisco in 1925, and Gable had a small role in the play. Pauline Frederick was in her 40s, he was 26. Apparently the affair with Gable was just a passing infatuation. 
The love of Pauline Frederick's life was actually actor, writer, playwright Willard Mack, to whom she was married for a mere two years from 1917 to 1919. Willard Mack is best remembered, if at all, for discovering a chorus girl named Ruby Stevens and changing her name to Barbara Stanwyck. With her stage training, Pauline Frederick made an easy transition to sound films, with one of her first talkies being This Modern Age in 1931, in which she plays Joan Crawford's mother. There's a signed and limited memorial edition of Muriel Elwood's biography of Pauline Frederick, published in 1940. And I am pleased to see that Joan Crawford is listed as one of the subscribers. Pauline Frederick's last major film role, a starring role, was a Senora Marino in Romona, 1936. Her last stage appearance was in Maxwell Anderson's The Mask of Kings, which opened in New York in February 1937. There was one last film appearance, which unfortunately was as Madame Chung opposite Peter Lorre in Thank You, Mr. Moto, 1937. Polly, as she was known to her friends, died in Beverly Hills on September 19, 1938, at the age of 55. Her Pekingese dog, Su Lin, died two days later. He refused to eat after his mistress's death. The Luke Cody and May McAvoy characters meet, and perhaps this is a good time to talk a little more about Luke Cody. He was married three times, twice in 1910 and 1913, to the same woman, actress Dorothy Dalton. He divorced Dalton in 1911 and 1940, and then in 1926 to comedian Mabel Normand, supposedly on a dare. I don't think he took marriage very seriously, but then I don't think he took life very seriously. He loved its finer things, including women, apparently. On his staff in the 1930s, he had two butlers and a masseur. He had two homes, one in Beverly Hills and one at the beach, both of which were the sites of many parties which Lou Cody hosted. At the time of his death, the Los Angeles Times described him as both a bon vivant and a man about town. In 1925, he told the fan magazine Movie Weekly, are the six methods whereby the weaker sex are certain to succumb to masculine charms. He certainly had a high opinion of himself and his attraction to women. The actor's father was a French-Canadian, but Louis-Joseph Coté, to give him his real name, grew up in New Hampshire, where he was born in 1884, and Maine. He had intended to study medicine, but instead joined a theatrical stock company in North Carolina, making his New York stage debut in Pierre of the Plains in 1908. Lou Cody entered films in 1914, working for producer Thomas H. Inns. He didn't really make a name for himself as a male vamp until 1919, when he co-starred opposite Gloria Swanson in Cecil B. DeMille's Don't Change Your Husband. He was pretty busy in the 1920s, starring in some 30-plus films opposite leading ladies who included René Adore, Florence Vido, Blanche Sweet, May Bush and Aileen Pringle. I say he played opposite them, but actually he was usually the other man in the story, the one who didn't finish up with the leading lady. Despite having a slight French accent, Lou Cody did okay in sound films, making almost 30 between 1930 and 1934. By now, of course, he was relegated to supporting player rather than leading man. Lou Cody died at his Beverly Hills home on May 31, 1934, after returning from a party at his beach house. He was only 50 years old. At the time of his death, he was hailed as an urbane villain who created a new type of leading man on screen. That door, I had mentioned earlier, was stolen on July 30, 1934, and nobody knows what happened to it. We just saw in an uncredited part as the butler, Tom Ricketts, who appropriately enough, in the very British role of a butler, was born in the UK in 1853. He had a long career on the stage, both in his native country and in the United States. As an actor, he has more than 200 films to his credit from 1908 through 1939, generally uncredited. Oddly enough, it's his first film, A Christmas Carol, for which he is best known. Produced by SNA in Chicago, it is the first screen adaptation of the Charles Dickens classic, with Tom Ricketts playing Scrooge, 
and released in December 1908. He also directed more than 150 short subjects between 1909 and 1916, one of which is claimed to be the first film shot in Hollywood. I somehow doubt this, despite no lesser source than the New York Times making the claim. Tom Ricketts died in West Hollywood in January 1939 at the age of 86. Pauline Frederick is certainly overdoing the use of talcum powder or whatever. The scene emphasises Mrs. Wilton's perceived need for all manner of perfumes and powders to keep her youthful appearance, while talking to her is a daughter who looks young, innocent and unpowdered. Here I have been discussing a bit player in Free Women, but I have yet to discuss its director in any detail. The reason, of course, is that what can one say about Ernst Lubitsch that has not already been written or said? He's the subject of at least 20 books, and those that have written about Lubitsch probably know far more about him than I do. He was admired not only by the critics, but also by his fellow directors. Jean Renoir announced that, quote, he invented the modern Hollywood, unquote, to John Ford, quote, none of us thought we were making anything but entertainment for the moment. Only Ernst Lubitsch knew we were making art, unquote. Orson Welles described him as, quote, a giant. Lubitsch's talent and originality are stupefying, unquote. There is actually a drinking establishment in West Hollywood named Bar Lubitsch, which claims to raise the level of the bar experience, just as Lubitsch did for the cinematic experience with his Lubitsch touch. The Lubitsch touch is, of course, synonymous with the director. It has, doesn't have much to do with dialogue, but more to do with subtlety, wit and charm. And certainly, as I have mentioned, it is evident here. Although not, I think, in great number. One critic has suggested that the phrase is nothing more than an effort by studio PR men to change Lubitsch into a brand name. Fellow director Billy Wilder summed it up, I quote, It was the elegant use of the super joke. You had a joke and you felt satisfied. And then there was one more big joke on top of it. The joke you didn't expect. That was the Lubitsch touch, unquote. Born in Berlin in 1892, Lubitsch entered the theatre in 1911, working with the legendary Max Reinhardt. He made his film debut as an actor in 1913 and continued working in that capacity through 1920. In 1914, he added direction to his resume. And in the late 1910s, Lubitsch became a major German director with films such as Carmen, 1918, with Pola Negri, The Oyster Princess, 1919, with Ozzy Oswalder, Passion, 1919, with Pola Negri and Emil Jannings, Sommerun, 1920, again with Pola Negri, and The Loves of Pharaoh, 1922, again with Emil Jannings. It was Mary Pickford who invited Lubitsch to Hollywood to direct her in Rosita, released in 1923, and the film was Pickford's attempt to branch out from the type of roles that had made her famous. After Rosita, which was not a success, Lubitsch signed a sixth film three-year deal with Warner Brothers, with Three Women being the second film under that deal. He moved on to MGM for The Student Prince in Old Heidelberg, starring Raymond Navarro and Norma, Sh Norma Shearer in 1927, and to Paramount for The Patriot, with Emil Jannings, released in 1928, for which he received his first Academy Award nomination. Lubitsch was nominated again for The Love Parade and Heaven Can Wait. With the coming of sound, he directed some of Hollywood's best early musicals, including The Love Parade, 1929, and Monte Carlo, 1930, both starring Jeanette MacDonald, before she started taking herself too seriously. As you look through a list of Lubitsch films of the 1930s and 1940s, there are so many that bring a pleasant smile of remembrance to one's face. For me, they are Broken Lullaby, the director's only really serious work, Designed for Living, The Merry Widow, Ninochka, The Shop Around the Corner, and To Be or Not To Be. Ernst Lubitsch died suddenly at his Bel Hare home in November 1947, he was only 55. I would be remiss if I did not end this brief biography with a response from Billy Wilder at the funeral. William Wilder said as the couple was leaving, no more Lubitsch. Billy Wilder responded, quote, worse than that, no more Lubitsch pictures, unquote. 
most of the contemporary criticism of free women was directed favorably at the director. This is somewhat surprising that Lubitsch had only made three American films, but of course, several of his German productions had received a release in the United States. The New York Sun wrote, quote, This photoplay you will remember. It was directed by Ernst Lubitsch, and beautifully directed too. In the opinion of the writer, it is the noted German director's best modern photoplay, unquote. In the New York Daily News, critic Mildred Spain wrote, quote, Lubitsch always seems to go through his scenes carrying a torch to light the dullness of a story. His little neat touches make the picture breathe instead of looking like it was filmed in the backyard by some trusty mechanic, unquote. I love that description. Mordant Hall in the New York Times commented, quote, It reveals Mr. Lubitsch as a talented stylist in direction, a producer who makes the most of every detail and whose work scintillates with original ideas, unquote. The only voice raised in objection was that of legendary reporter Harry Carr, who wrote in the Los Angeles Times that the film was, quote, a horrible idea. It should never have been filmed, unquote. There are two assistant directors on Free Women, both of whom worked with Lubitsch on The Marriage Circle. James Flood ended his career as an assistant director with Free Women and went on to become a fully-fledged director with many unimportant films to his credit. Henry Blanke is of more interest as he worked with Lubitsch initially in Germany, becoming an assistant director there in 1920. When Lubitsch moved on from Warner Brothers, Blanke remained, but returned to Germany heading the studio's German production. He was responsible for bringing William Dieterle to Hollywood. In 1931, Henry Blanke became a staff producer at the studio, responsible for an amazing number of classic Warner Brothers titles, including The Life of Emil Zola, The Adventures of Robin Hood, The Seahawk, The Maltese Falcon, The Treasure of Sierra Madre, and The Nun Story. And it all began thanks to his working with Ernst Lubitsch. Henry Blanke died in Los Angeles in May 1981 at the age of 79. Three women also boasts two cameramen, both of whom had worked previously with Lubitsch. Charles Rocher was Mary Pickford's cinematographer, and it was natural that he should have photographed Lubitsch's first American film starring Pickford, Rosita. Charles Van Enger had photographed Lubitsch's second American film, The Marriage Circle. Prior to making Free Women, Lubitsch wrote a brief article in American Cinematographer in which he wrote of his privilege to work with both Rocher and Van Enger. He continued, quote, In Berlin, it had almost become a slogan, American photography. It meant brilliance in technique, subtlety in workmanship, feeling and atmosphere in lighting. To be a cinematographer in America meant to be an inventor, a man who is always on the lookout for novel discoveries. The first question is always, quote, what does the cinematographer say to this? And his answer settles the matter. It seems to me that they take care and train their camera as a dog fancier would his pets. Every cinematographer has his particular technique. This desire to be able to do something that no one else can do is significant of the whole profession." Unquote. Lubitsch explained that he didn't have to bring a German camera crew with him to Hollywood because Hollywood cinematographers were in a class by themselves. Charles Rocher didn't work with Lubitsch again, although of course he did work with another legendary director, F.W. Murnau, co-filming Sunrise. Charles Van Enger shot Lubitsch's next Warner Brothers film, Lady Windermere's Fan. Charlie, as Lubitsch called Van Enger, had a good working relationship with the director. Quote, not once did he ever look for the camera as long as I was with him, unquote. Both cinematographers did their most famous work in the silent era, with later sound films of lesser distinction. Why Lubitsch needed two cameramen on the film is unknown. I can find no explanation of it in contemporary documentation. Usually it signified that one cinematographer proved unsatisfactory and was replaced by another, but this does not appear to be the situation here. The Luke Cody character reads a letter from boyfriend Fred, telling Jeannie he is taking an internship in New York, thus bringing him closer to Jeannie and helping the plot along. It also serves to remind us of Fred, whom we haven't seen for some time, and that he does have a relevance to the story.
We may have forgotten Fred, but he has not forgotten Jeanie, as he cuts out her photograph from a group shot. What a sad, pathetic creature he is. There are times in this film when one feels like rooting for Luke Cody. Playing Fred's mother and earning a thousand dollars a week for her work is Mary Carr, who was perhaps the most famous screen mother of the silent era, although an argument might be made for Mary Morris, whose career began a few years earlier and who died in 1918. Mary Carr doesn't have a lot to do here, but she does it well. A lover, loving and little overbearing mother, who is perhaps responsible for her son's lack of vigour and failure ardently to pursue Mae McAvoy. She began her film career in 1914, and while she was generally cast in supporting roles, after all, mothers are not usually to be found in leading roles unless they happen to be played by Pauline Frederick, she did achieve stardom in 1920 with Over the Hill to the Poor House, a melodrama of a mother abandoned by her children and forced into the workhouse. It's based on what was a fairly well-known 1872 poem by Will Carlton. Read it. It's not bad. Certainly not as turgid as one might imagine. Anyway, with the coming of sound, roles became fewer and fewer. Mary Carr herself might have finished up in the workhouse, if they still existed. But instead, she ended her days in June 1973 at the Motion Picture Country House. She was 99 years old. Notice the paucity of subtitles or intertitles in this sequence. Three minutes or more of screen time and only three title cards. In fact, you don't really need the title cards because it's not that difficult to read the lips of the players. They are pretty much acting out the story as if participating in a drama on stage. Rather than just rely on the facial expressions of the actors, which couldn't be bettered, one is drawn to their lips reading them despite perhaps having zero knowledge of how to read lips. The director Lubitsch is not only controlling the actors, he is actually controlling the audience and its reaction to the drama on screen. A remarkable achievement by one man. The melodrama here is intense but not over the top, thanks to the performances of Pauline Frederick and Lou Cody. I have not been too kind in discussing Lou Cody, but we see here how competent an actor he can be. To his fellow male protagonists, he comes across as just one of them. They openly endorse his seduction of Mrs. Wilton in order to gain access to her wealth, which they assume will then be shared. He is made, in the words of one critic, to seem as human as most villains so frequently are in real life. Pauline Frederick generates strong credibility as she changes from a woman with somewhat loose mommels to a mother with strong feelings that signify a good woman. Isn't there a hint of an older Gloria Swanson in her looks? She goes from coy and innocent to angry and demonic. And the briefcase which Luke Cody carries about for several of the scenes suddenly takes on a new use as Mrs. Wilton grabs it from Lamont's grasp and throws it across the floor. Even the Chinese servant in the background serves a purpose as his actions inform Mrs. Wilton of the reality of the situation, helping her, for the first time, to come to her senses. It is as if the servant is giving her a slap in the face without actually coming into contact with the woman. The intercutting also plays its part, taking the action from the anger of the Pauline Frederick character to the calm arrival of Mae McAvoy. And then the two women present a united front. And here we reach the most extraordinary moment in the film, as it is revealed, with almost no explanatory titles, that Lamont has had sex with Jeannie. It is all told with a few knowing glances and one title, quote, I 
can't see that you should have any objection to our marriage, unquote. A remarkable achievement and a remarkable situation for an American film of this period, or later for that matter. One is reminded of the, of the words of Mervyn Leroy when he presented Lubitsch with an honorary Academy Award in 1947, as he referenced Lubitsch as a master of innuendo, with, quote, an adult mind and a hatred of saying things the obvious way, unquote. There is nothing here that the censor could find fault with, wrote Ferrati. But of course there was. The Chicago Censorship Board demanded considerable cutting, with the, the support, it must be noted, of the Chicago Tribune. Viewing the censored version, its critic, May Tine, a play on words and also being pronounced as Matale, wrote, quote, Free women, as it stands, is graphic and unpleasant enough, if uncut, it was even more so than for once at least the scissors did a good job. I think whatever the censors eliminated is probably well lost to the world. And be it said that the great director Mr. Lubitsch in Free Women didn't turn out anything over which he need crow unduly. It's interesting that while Hollywood censorship czar Will Hayes was arguing that clean pictures are what are needed to bring audiences to the movie theatre, Ferrati reported that the reality was that audiences wanted sex, and the more sexy a film was, the more it was wanted. In San Francisco, it was pointed out that the highest grossing films in October 1924 were the B.B. Daniels vehicle Sinners in Heaven, in which a man and a maid are stranded on a desert island in a story that, quote, defied convention, unquote, and, of course, three women. They grossed $19,000 and $19,500, respectively, while a clean picture could only manage to gross $17,000. Fred comes back into Jeannie's life, and she realises her true feelings. It has to be admitted that Mae McAvoy as Jeannie does overreact at times in this scene. As Ferrati pointed out, she could not for a moment compete with the more experienced actress, Pauline Frederick. And yet again, no titles necessary for Fred to learn she is already engaged. And again, be aware in this scene and the next between Fred and his mother, a total of almost four minutes, there are only two titles. I met Mae McAvoy only once back in 1977 when I was involved in an exhibit and issuance ceremony for a US postage stamp honouring the 50th anniversary of sound in the American film industry and the 50th anniversary of the film generally considered responsible, The Jazz Singer, in which Mae McAvoy stars as Al Jolson's love interest. Isn't it tragic that today one probably could not screen the jazz singer because of Al Jolson, its star being in blackface? I was just thinking, in fact, that the three films most influential in the history of American cinema are basically banned by the reactionary left-wingers obsessed with political correctness, as they term, determine it to be. I refer, of course, to The Birth of a Nation, The Jazz Singer, and Gone with the Wind. Anyway... I will stop with the political diatribe and return to Mae McAvoy. She was a very nice old lady, somewhat diminutive, charming and talkative. Her best-known silent film is, of course, Ben-Hur, released in 1926, in which she co-starred with Raymond Navarro and Francis X. Bushman. After The Jazz Singer, Mae made one of her major sound films, The Terror, which is famous for being totally a talkie with spoken credits. It is not known to exist, but it doesn't have a reputation for being a great film. With the coming of sound, May McAvoy married well and retired from the screen. She returned to movies not as a star, but as an extra. Not because she needed the money, but because it was something to do, and she enjoyed the friendly atmosphere on the set. She was one of a group of extras that Louis B. Mayer at MGM put under contract, and she liked coming to work every day, sitting around and talking to her peers, extras who had once been silent leading men and women. I have to say, you know, looking at posters for three women, it's quite amazing that Mae McAvoy is listed first in the, in the list of stars, followed by Pauline Frederick. 
I assume this is because she was under contract to warn of us and Pauline Frederick was not. And now we are back with Fred and his mother. The character of the mother is really quite irrelevant. She could just as easily have been dropped from the storyline. Based on the embrace and the lengthy kiss on the lips, Fred certainly gives new meaning to the term mama's boy. It is positively cringe-making. But then mother love was very much a strong element in popular entertainment of the 1920s. Mary Carr was 50 years old when she made Three Women, and she is obviously made up to look much older. We return to Lou Cody, making a date with Harriet, who is a newcomer to the storyline. Lou Cody was known as the Butterfly Man, thanks to his title role in the 1920 film of that name, which I do not believe exists anymore. It is of interest because it was one of the last films to be directed by Ida Ray Park, a prominent female director at Universal who is sadly little remembered today. The sobriquet of Butterfly Man comes from the behaviour of a butterfly that flits from one flower to another, just as a butterfly man flits from one woman to another. Or in Luke Cody's case here, from one woman to another to another. It is worth noting that while he was making the Zeta with Mary Pickford, Lubitsch had Luke Cody film a screen test for the role of Mephistopheles, the representative of the devil who bargains with Faust for his soul. It would have been interesting casting, and shows that Lubitsch was aware of Lou Cody long before he made Free Women. Free Women was one of six features released by Warner Brothers as part of its 1924-1925 season. The other five are very much forgotten today. The film cost a reported $329,000 to produce, although this figure would not have included marketing and distribution costs. It grossed worldwide, in other words, rentals that actually went to Warner Brothers, $438,000. So it made a reasonable, but not a great profit. While the Lou Cody character takes care of his nails and displays appropriate male arrogance, May McAvoy as a dutiful little wife is selecting his wardrobe for the evening. Playing Fred's unnamed friend, whom we saw earlier in the Berkeley sequence, is Raymond McKee, who starred in a series of Smith family comedies for Max Sennett in the mid to late 1920s. In later years, he ran a restaurant in Los Angeles and died in Long Beach at the age of 91 in October 1984. Making up the trio of women is Mary Prevost as Harriet, though his appearance seems almost like an afterthought. Verratti described her role as, quote, little better than a bit in the story, unquote. The film might just as easily have been titled Two Women. At least one critic at the time suggested that her character was nothing more than a lady of pleasure, in other words, a prostitute. Perhaps the character is here simply to give Mary Prevost a role. The actress had already worked for Ernst Lubitsch on the previous film, The Marriage Circle, and a year after Three Women, she was again to star for Lubitsch in Kiss Me Again. Canadian-born Mary Prevost began her career as a Max Sennett bathing beauty around 1917. She was never really much of a star and weight problems didn't help. She died in Hollywood in January 1937 at the age of 40. And I'm not going to get into the ridiculous story of her being eaten by her dog. You can read about that elsewhere. If nothing else, Mary Prevost was certainly popular in 1924. While appearing in Three Women, she was also working on Being Respectable, directed by Phil Rosen at Warner Brothers. 
This doubling up on films was not that unusual. Even Pauline Frederick worked on Free Women during the day, while at night she was appearing on stage with the Morosco Stock Company. Quote, doubling up on pictures still seems to be one of the favourite pastimes of the more popular players, unquote, reported film critic Edwin Shallot in the Los Angeles Times. There are several mentions at this time of an actress named Opal Evans, who is appearing in Free Women at Night and in Paul Burns Open All Night during the day. The only problem is that there is no actress named Opal Evans in the credits for either film. And in fact, I can find no record of a lady named Opal Evans working in the film industry. I can only assume that she was an extra with an eye on publicity, which she certainly generated. The third woman is not introduced until late in the story, after the husband has lost interest in the first woman and that woman's daughter, now his wife. With the third woman, Lamont can enjoy the dancing and fun at a ballroom modelled after the Coconut Grove at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, where everyone would reach for the dancing monkeys hanging from the ceiling. I don't believe these scenes were actually shot at the Coconut Grove, although one of the fake palm trees associated with a nightclub is quite visible here. And an interesting coincidence, Poland Negri, whom Lubitsch had made a star with his German films, lived at the Ambassador Hotel when she came to Los Angeles as a Paramount star. For the film's initial showing, Warner Brothers organized a banquet at San Francisco's St. Francis Hotel in August 1924. At the same time, exhibitors across the United States were invited to view a print of the film as it was transported from one city to another. Three Women received its New York premiere at the Mark Strand Theatre on October 5, 1924. A number of contemporary sources give August 14th as the film's release date, but in view of the date of the New York opening, this cannot be correct. One would perhaps have assumed that Lamont's being hit over the head with a champagne bottle might have killed him. But that would have been too easy a manner in which to wind up the plot. He is only concussed. A minor point, but isn't it interesting the amount of alcohol that is consumed in this film? And there is no reference whatsoever to its taking place at the height of Prohibition. Of course, Prohibition or the Volstead Act was to have little impact in Hollywood, where each studio had its own bootlegger. And as this film illustrates, wealthy members of society had ready access to cocktails and other alcoholic beverages throughout this period. The Mary Trivas character seems to lose interest in Lamont, particularly as it appears she is being thrown out of the nightclub by the management, who perhaps have identified her as a loose woman. Luckily, boyfriend Fred is there, being his usual dreary self. You can be sure he's not enjoying a drink. Fred is shaken from his usual lethargy by a real-life medical emergency, and later he is persuaded to accompany Lamont to his house. The automobile here seems remarkably similar to the so-called cab that the Willard Lewis character used, and which took Lamont to Mrs. Wilson's Park Avenue mansion for the first time. Of course, I have to say that it seems to be a different driver. The Mary Prevost character is very good at manipulating men. Even Fred seems taken in by her wiles. So much is suddenly revealed. Jeannie discovers that her husband has not been at a business meeting. Fred discovers Lamont's identity. May McAvoy discovers that with very little effort, she is capable of endless melodramatic gestures. And Pierre Gendron shows himself capable of continuing in a lethargic stupor, despite what the script might demand. But he does his best to try and emulate May McAvoy in the melodrama department. Only Luke Cody shows himself capable of a little subtlety in his acting. But then, of course, his character has been concussed. Here, Luke Cody is looking at his age for the first time. And he's the only one of the trio who proves himself to be a capable actor. 
One historian has suggested that Lubitsch's previous film, The Marriage Circle, demonstrates Oscar Wilde's epigram. The one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. The same may be said of free women, and once that deception has been revealed, the marriage comes tumbling apart, quite violently as it happens here. It's interesting, by the way, when you think about it, that, that you know, what Oscar Wilde is to literature, one might argue that Ernst Lubitsch is to film. Never thought of that before. As we see the gigantic doors and high ceilings of the Lamont residence, which seems remarkably similar to the residence of Mrs. Wilton, perhaps I should mention the art director responsible, Sven Gade. He was multi-talented, not just an art director, but also a screenwriter and film director. Sven Gade was born in Copenhagen in 1877 and began his career in Denmark as a writer and director. His greatest success at that time was the direction of the formidable Danish actress Asta Nielsen in the title role of Hamlet in 1921. He seems to have been brought to America by Mary Pickford, who saw his work on Hamlet, which also included the art direction, and he worked as art director on Rosita, sharing credit with the legendary art director and production designer William Cameron Menzies, whose credits, of course, include Gone with the Wind. Why Pickford would need Sven Gade when she had William Cameron Menzies, I do not know. And nor is there any contemporary documentation as to what each man contributed to the film. Sven Gade has solo credit for art direction on Free Women, and then he turns to screenwriting and direction with five credits in each capacity, then nothing. After 1929 he has no US credits, and one assumes with the coming of Saud he returned to Denmark, working in the theatre and where he died in June 1952, at the age of 75. Even if Lubitsch did not bring Sven Gade with him to Hollywood, it seems likely that the two men knew each other in Europe, and Lubitsch was familiar with his work as a director. Yet why did Lubitsch decide to use Sven Gade as an art director, despite his having only one American film, a costume drama, to his credit? It would appear that Sven Gade returned briefly to Europe after Rosita and worked on a German film starring Henny Porton. And that seems to have been a modern story, so perhaps that in some way influenced Lubitsch. Who knows? Lubitsch used the same two assistant directors on Free Women that he had on The Marriage Circle. So why did he not use the same two art directors from that film on Free Women? They were all after all under contract to the studio. Sven Gade is obviously someone deserving of further research. Apropos of art direction of silent films with modern settings, I have to say that on the whole it is not very good. It seems art directors or technical directors, as they were often called, are not expert at recreating a typical interior of the period. Perhaps they have to rely on what the studio has available in the way of furnishings and props, or perhaps, as I was told by one art director, they would rather take a trip to furnish a supplier Barker Brothers in downtown LA and pick out what they could borrow for a short term. While we are waiting for Pauline Frederick to take the initiative and shoot Lou Cody, let me talk briefly about the digital image we are viewing. It is a digital copy from 35mm film elements owned by George Eastman House, now known as the George Eastman Museum. In 1967, the archive had acquired a 35mm safety fine-grained master from the Cinematheque Française. A 35mm master of English language titles, translated from the French, was made in 1975. And in 1981, a 35mm dupe negative and print was made from both fine grains. The English titles were cut into the dupe negative and a new print was made in 1981. For this current release, George Eastman House made new titles, utilising a font identical to that used in Warner Bros. films of the same period. Considering that this is not a digital restoration, the film looks very good and I commend the staff at George Eastman House. 
The George Eastman House material is 6,647 feet in length. A Motion Picture News booking guide from 1924 claims a running time for the film of 7,400 feet. Something or things are missing. Approximately five minutes of footage. But what we do not know. Well, maybe that Barry Prevost made an appearance earlier than she does in this version. That's just a guess. It does strike me that she appears somewhat abruptly. We had not been aware of the characters being in Lamont's life earlier in the film. Just as I was about to record this commentary, I discovered, to my amazement, that the original novel, Lily's Marriage, subtitled A Moral Image of Berlin, and the previous no novel, Lily, had both been filmed a few years earlier in G Germany, in 1919 to be exact, directed by Jap Speyer. The film starred, presumably in the Pauline Frederick role, an actress named Leopoldine Constantin, who is best known to American audiences for her performance in Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious. And also in the 1919 films is Reinhold Schunzel, who is also featured in Notorious. Those 1919 productions are indicative of the popularity of the original novels, which sold more than 100,000 copies. Pauline Frederick has shot Lou Cody. There is no tussle with ownership of the gun, as I noticed some modern commentators have claimed. It is Pauline Frederick alone who takes the gun from the drawer and pulls the trigger, and not before time. The servants have gathered around the body of their master and they don't seem particularly perturbed by what they see. Perhaps they are used to outrageous behaviour in the Lamont mansion. No concern about moving the body as the servants carry it away. Maeve McAvoy picks up the incriminating let love letters and burns them. It seems almost as if this is a happy, if flawed ending. But it's not over till it's over, and one portly policeman arrives at the end of the scene. The words of Ernst Lubitsch, writing in 1927, seem somewhat appropriate here. Quote, a story must be complete and logical to achieve success in Europe, while here, in America, the story can be perfectly illogical so long as it amuses. Unquote. The trial, which should really be the climax of the film, and should certainly have been shown with some key moments, almost appears as an afterthought. There is a newspaper headline that the verdict will be announced that day, yet how can the newspaper know when the verdict is to be announced? The first scene is of Mrs. Wilton appearing on the stand, which surely should have happened earlier. She asks for punishment, for being a negligent and frivolous mother, but does not regret the shooting. There is no final summing up by prosecution or defence attorneys. Mrs. Wilton is sitting next to her daughter and the daughter's boyfriend, which would not have been allowed in a courtroom, particularly at a trial where the lady is accused of murder. A camera angle at one point shows that the trio are seated facing the aforementioned camera, but with their backs to the judge. And Mrs. Wilton is allowed to walk over and face the, the jury, admittedly with a portly looking policeman standing behind her. How can the verdict be anything but guilty? But no. The jury, who look ready to head off home as quickly as possible, carrying their hats and coats, and find her not guilty. There's not even a title, just a shake of the foreman's head. This is quite ludicrous. If nothing else, of course, the trial sequence reminded contemporary audiences of Pauline Frederick's best-known film and stage production, Madam X. We see Pauline Frederick, we see May McAvoy and Pierre Gendron, but the final shot is not of them, but of Mary Carr replacing the lace doilers underneath the ornaments in her apartment. The significance escapes me, except the doily represents beauty and order, which is presumably restored here. Perhaps they represent old-fashioned values, such as the sanctity of marriage. I really don't know. And so, this is Anthony Slide, really not knowing what is going on, but thanking you for listening and watching. And I have hoped you have enjoyed Free Women as much as I have enjoyed researching and talking about it. <laughs>